in a market that's falling, I'm okay with flipping and the, but only quick flips. I'm not going to buy anything that could be a one or two month remodel because yeah. this it's a, it's a game of hot potato. Yeah. Like you're, ha- you're having to buy based on these inflated prices. Um, in a perfect world, I would say, well, th- right now they're selling for 150, but I, I know that it's only worth 120. So I'll buy it for 90, hoping to sell it for 120, mm. but you're not going to be able to buy a house. So gotcha. the w- one strategy is sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Another is you have to like go ahead right now and flip knowing that the prices are inflated, but you got to be quick and you got to be willing to, you know, don't take anything long term, try to sell it below market and sell it quick and be quick to lower the price because there is everybody getting a ton of offers. If you're not getting an offer in the first week, the, then you got to lower that price because it means you're chasing the bottom. Helping hardworking real estate investors, agents, and entrepreneurs grow a better business, mindset, and future. This is the Carrot Cast Podcast. Now here's your host, Trevor Mock. What's up, y'all? Coming at you with a, another amazing guest. Actually, one thing that we've been talking about a lot in the Carrot Cast is what's to come. You know, like what's to come in 2021, 2022. And so what I'm doing is I'm starting a series as we go. It's not going to be a, a series where every week one of these is going to be rolled out, but you're going to be able to see consistent interviews with experts in certain things like monetary policy, like the economy, the macro and the micro, like investing in general. Um, and then when you dive into the real estate side of things, I want, I want to bring on multifamily experts. What should those people be looking at uh, in, in, in for 2021, 2022? Um, and now what we're going to focus in on is foreclosures. Okay. So where we are right now, I'm going to give a little preview and then we're going to introduce uh, Aaron. Where we are right now, as of the time we're recording this is uh, what we hope to be the tail end of the COVID stuff. I, I thought, I thought that's how it was a couple months ago, but uh, we're still in it. And there's a lot of different things happening around the moratoriums, around foreclosures and evictions and just a bunch of stuff. And I was looking at Aaron, I'll post a bunch of stuff on his Instagram. I'll link up his Instagram profile in the show notes, uh, whether you're on YouTube or the blog post. Uh, But we'll give you guys, if you're listening to it on the podcast, we'll give you guys a spot to go find him because he's been posting up a bunch of cool stuff on his Instagram showing how he's looking at foreclosures and foreclosure auctions and the foreclosure numbers that he's seeing change and adjust and what he predicts for 2021. 2022. And we're just going to really dig into a bunch of data right now. And how can you as a real estate investor prep in a much better way for any changes that happen into the market after election, after 2021 hits and uh, what he's looking at on the foreclosure side. So Aaron, uh, what's up, man? Welcome back to the Carecast. Yeah. The, thanks for having me back. It, it's always, it's always fun to chat. It's always fun to chat with you, Trevor's when we get to talk about kind of trends and real estate and both of us are looking at all sorts of different things. And, and yeah, it's just a broad reach right now. As we try to look at the different news that's out here, I think this new series you're doing is, is super cool because there are so many pieces that we need to arm ourselves with, with like the news out there to figure out what's next and, mm-hmm. and what we should really be focusing on. Dude, so in, in in the last episode, we had a chance to dig into your story and, and kind of where you came from. And and we'll give a, maybe a, a micro version of it here, but we're going to link up the first episode in the show notes. So guys and gals, go check out that one. Uh, it's an amazing story um, and, and really how Aaron grew his business to tons of rental properties, um, mm-hmm. how he's bought tons of houses at the foreclosure steps, how he built a big business, one of the biggest, if not the biggest house buying business in and around the Sacramento er- Mento area, lost the business and then rebuilt out, back up another business. And you know, he's been through uh, the full cycle before he, he went through uh, the downturn the first time, saw the upswing happen. And so any experts that we bring in, in here on, on this next series are people who have been through a full cycle, at least a full cycle, because uh, there's a lot of experts out there right now who are amazing at wholesaling the last four years or amazing at whatever, and they've only known an upswing market. And so we're going to be bringing on people who have been through the cycles so we can look ahead. So Aaron, why don't you give like the, the cliff notes? Um, who are you? you know, what, what do you do? I know you're an investor and a software company owner that works with investors, uh, but who are you? What do you do? And uh, where are you at right now? Yeah. And, and I love part of that intro too, because you talk about on one of my podcasts last week, I was saying, Hey, everybody looked like a brilliant investor over the last five years. Mm-hmm. Like if somebody started buying it, And so these are the times when, uh, when it's just a little bit different, when the market's changing, when it's not just easy business where the true people come out and you get to, people will pivot and people will change businesses. 
you know, I was, I had a background, you know, Trevor and I grew up in the same town. Mm-hmm. The, uh, you know, my wife and Trevor sat next to each other in class, the, and we yeah. found very different paths as we went and did stuff, you know, 2000 and you know, early 2000s, I moved down to California. I graduated at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in construction management. It's like the height of the housing boom. We were building tons of houses. Everything was awesome. Uh, 2007 market started to crash hard. In 2008, my, you know, my pay got cut in half from running that home builder. We laid off 70 people. Mm. There was five of us left. And at that time, foreclosures were just happening like crazy. And we didn't really know what to do. Um, I had started to look into different businesses, trying to buy, you know, REOs direct from lenders. So we could fix them and flip them. We were just trying all these different business plans, but we didn't know the right guys. And we realized later you had to be friends with the guy to really get the deal back then. We, we said, well, we, we call it like going further up, upstream. We said, well, what happens before? Well, before an, you know, an agent gets it as an REO, an auction actually happens at the courthouse steps. Mm-hmm. In 2009, we started teaching ourselves that process. There was only two or three other bidders. The very first time we went to auction hundreds of houses, it was a very secret mm-hmm. business. No one knew about it. Um, my second baby was born about six weeks early. But at that time, my wife, Kalina, was working nights as a waitress mm. you know, at a casino. So at 2 a.m., she's running around. And when my baby was born early, I felt like this was my fault. I got to go try something. That was my moment. I quit my job working for the other guys and went all in on starting this new business. We, you know, we had a lot of fun in foreclosures. We had a lot of stuff we had to learn. Like I said, nobody was doing the business. So we had to kind of make it up as we went and go try things. I got to take my experience from home building to do that. We flipped over a thousand houses between 2009 and 2012. Man, we had no idea how good we had it. Um, we'll get into it a little bit later though, because between 2009 and like 2012, the market was still falling every month, Yep. right? And so there are some strategies on how to make money in a falling market. The last five years, it's been a growing market. So we'll get into some of those strategies on how we were able to make money in a falling market and how I think next year people will be able to do mm. those same strategies. 2013, 2014, foreclosures became easy. You know, Blackstone, those big companies came and put us out of business because they came and started buying on the courthouse steps. We lost everything. We were like, man, how am I going to restart this business? The, uh, was a little smarter the next time, 2014, 2015, I found, you know, auctions in other states and other places. Texas was one, one of my first big ones. We started redoing auctions out there. We own 350 rentals now, you know, near the Austin area. We decided one of the things I learned from 2009 to 2012 was, man, I should have invested some money instead of just, I thought that the money was just going to keep coming. I was very cocky. I didn't, I was not very humble and I didn't save anything. And so this time, as we started buying, every time we buy a few, we'd sa- we save most of them as rentals, use a couple as flips. Hmm. And along the way, I also acquired Roddy's foreclosure listing service. I was a customer, you know, buying data at that time, they had foreclosure data for 20 different counties in Texas. Yep. Now we treat it for all 256 <laughs> counties in Texas. We go grab that data ourselves. We go to courthouses pull the stuff off the wall, turn it into data. And now, and then we have a whole bunch of public records data nationwide that we've been playing with. So it's when we get to talk about data and what's happening, some of the stuff is just what our team has, just what we have and nobody else has it. Other data that we have on a nationwide basis is, is out there. But the, we, we, I really, I love everything real estate. I was able to do that many flips and that many properties by, you know, building my own software to track that. And mm-hmm. it was a couple of years ago, I said, Hey, I'm going to use that software I built for myself you give it to everybody else. So cool. the, uh, that's the, the elevator pitch on how I get in, but I, I love everything in real estate. I love the software. I love the data. I love trying to predict early in 2009 when the market was falling, we had to predict which zip codes were safe to invest in. Hmm. So that's where I really started, you know, looking at data and how I determined what areas were safe to invest in. So ever since then, I've loved data. Dude. So I, I, I want to dig in, into that in a big way. And like you're, like you were saying there, I just want to kind of map this out for people really fast. So what, what Aaron was going through was uh, he was working with the home builder before the last crash, which stuff was popping then. And as you look right now, as real estate agents, even home builders, stuff's flying off, off the shelves, right? It's like uh, the, the time on market's crazy low right now, right? Even here in Ro- Roseburg, Oregon, kind of at that tail end of COVID stuff is going for more than it ever has and selling faster than it ever has. Interest rates are crazy low, inventory is low. I will kind of dig into that stuff. But dude, uh, this, this, isn't, this isn't a loaded question. I'm just kind of curious from your perspective. Do you see any parallels from 2007 versus today? If so, what are they? And also, what, what, are, what, what do you feel is fundamentally different also uh, in, yeah. in, in that? Yeah. So the, so 2005, 2000, you know, the peak of the housing market and what's going on right now, there are a lot of parallels that are very close. And those parallels that are very close is new homes are getting sold before they're finished. 
right? That doesn't usually happen in a normal market. That happens in an overly hot market where as soon as the house gets finished, people are moving in and they're having backlogs and prices are going up significantly. We're seeing right now, you know, houses selling for sometimes 20 to 30% more than they would have sold for six months ago. Yep. Right. Now that's a frenzied market. That's now they'll appraise right now because multiple people are willing to buy that stuff. Mm-hmm. But the, but that to me is an overpriced market that's based on something other than fundamental demand, other than yep. fundamental lasting demand. It's short-term demand. That's really propping that up. And it could just be because supply is way down. It's because, you know, with COVID people want to move, but for whatever reason, the, uh, the, the demand is really outweighing supply. And so mm-hmm. people are I I listed a house on the market that it was worth, I couldn't sell it for 120 last year. I lit, I decided I'm gonna go crazy and list it for 140. I've received 11 offers so far Hmm. on it. And the, you know, and all of them are over asking, you know, some are like 150. So a house is selling for 150,000. That's worth 120. Mm -hmm. And my renter just moved out. He was renting it for 1100 a month. And so that's an example of what you see. And we're hearing the same stories. I'm interviewing real estate agents all over the U S and they're seeing the same thing. So that, those are the parallels. The parallels are very hot market. Uh, prices have gone up dramatically over the last you know 12 months, really dramatically over the last six months. Mm-hmm. And, um, and when you see things like that, it's tough to outweigh it. Two things that are different is interest rates right now are lower than they were back then. Yep. And the, and most of the people right now who are, so as we see a correction, I believe we're going to see a correction. As we see that mm-hmm. correction, way more people right now have equity than they had back then. Okay. You know, people lost their equity really, really quickly in like 2007 and 2008 because these five hundred thousand dollar houses they had five hundred. They were getting you know loans at the time were one hundred percent financing. Yep. They were adjustable rates. You know, so people you know the moment they bought it, they were twenty thousand you know dollars underwater. Mm-hmm. And they were expecting that it was going to continue to go up right now is an interesting time to invest. Cause it's kind of like playing hot potato. Yeah. Like I can buy a house right now if I'm going to try to sell it next week, but there's also a chance that that turn is going to happen. So, um, that's two, the biggest fundamental difference is there's more equity in the market. Most of the loans there are, you know, safer, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, mass chances, but then unemployment really, you know, makes that change as well. Back into that, you know, a lot of the loans that originated in 2004 and 2005 also were, you know, people had taken out seconds on their houses so they could yep. pull out, you know, cash out refinance. They'd take $200,000 and they'd go buy boats and toys and jet skis. I haven't seen that over the last couple, you know, couple mm-hmm. years. We've had really good economies, but I haven't seen cash out refis are not the same with that, you know, that we, that we saw back then. So that was one of the problems that when the foreclosure started happening in 2007, uh, that really made that more dramatic. Gotcha, dude. So, so with, and that's really good information because I'll, I'll get people asking that, those questions right there. And the guys, 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 this is the value of knowing someone who has been through a full cycle, if not more than one, because you won't get that perspective. You, you won't get the perspective of, Oh, let's compare how it was before the last crash versus before the correction here. Uh, you won't get that. You, you'll only, you'll only get what that person theoretically has learned from other people who have been through that. So make sure you guys are plugging into firsthand sources who have been through a full cycle or more. Um, so Aaron, you, you talked about the differences there, you know, interest rates are crazy low right now, which, uh, they've kind of only got one way to go up uh, over the next year or two, um, has a lot more equity in, in the market, which, which is a really good positive thing. The, um, one, one thing that, that I've seen is the, the millennial generation now is kind of right in there close to, if not at their kind of prime buying years, which is a huge, huge generation that has good, uh, lots of money. And so that, that's a good positive, healthy thing that is fueling a good hunk of this. A lot of the people, uh, like here, here at carrot, um, I can't tell you the specific number, but I can't remember, but the last two or three months, it's been insane how many people are selling their houses and buying them. And almost everybody is within that millennial cohort because they bought the really small starter home, you know, five, six, seven years ago, maybe not even that, maybe like four years ago, it's gone up in equity so much. And now they're wanting to sell it, get some money and they're, they're upgrading. And so I, th- I think that, you know, that, that is a healthy thing as long as those jobs stay intact for those people. So with, with more equity being in the market, um, what's the difference there foreclosure wise that, that may come up this next time? Are you seeing the potential wave of foreclosures like there was before? Is it a, is a smaller wave? Like kind of where do you see foreclosures likely popping up this next time? Yeah. And I'll, I'll pull up my screen in a second too, and try to like kind of look at some foreclosure data. But the, the biggest cool. strategy I can tell people this time is something unique is happening right now where we're, you know, 
there's foreclosure moratoriums right now. They just got extended through the end of the year, you know, and, and every month we've been trying to do analysis on what we see is going to impact with that. But now that it's been extended through the end of the year, it means like only 20 to 25% of foreclosures are getting posted. They're going to be commercial loans, business loans, but something that how someone is, if someone's living in the house with a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac or an FHA loan, it's not getting posted. Mm -hmm. um, but there are plenty of properties getting posted and you know, most of them have equity. Something that's unique though is only a small fraction are actually selling. So it okay. used to be, you know, 30 to 40% of the postings would sell right now, something like 5%. There's a unique opportunity for anybody out there that's an investor, you know, to be able to look at that because we used to have three weeks to, if somebody got posted for foreclosure in Texas, three weeks later is the auction. Hmm. So if you were going to go try to knock on that door and say, Hey, you only owe 75,000 on your house. It's worth 140. I'll pay you a hundred for it, or let's partner on it, or let's do something. Cause I'm a real estate expert. It used to only have three weeks to make that happen. And so it was a lot harder. You had to buy in cash or you had to do some, you know, you know, some subject to and take over payments. It was, it was a much faster paced process right now. Someone can get posted and they're getting, we're seeing some get posted five, six months in a row. Well, and so you've got a lot more chances to meet that, meet up with that owner that has equity and say, Hey, let's, let's partner on something. Let's make a deal. You don't have to get foreclosed on. So that's, um, that's an opportunity we see in the foreclosure market. The, I'll pull up my screen and just, you know, kind of show some statistics that we've tried to look at for what we think. Your question was, you know, will there be a, a wave and will that wave look like last time? And mm -hmm. one thing that is significantly different here is the amount of government intervention that's happening very quickly. We had a lot of government, governor, government intervention back in 2010. I remember foreclosure moratoriums that postponed things for a few months and then they came back. Do you see my chart here, Trevor? Yep. Yep. I got it. All right. So when we see numbers, this is, you know, this, these are in Texas. We're the only people that have these numbers, but they're, but if you look nationwide, all the places, you know, Arizona, California, Oregon, places that had normal kind of foreclosure cycles. Not every state, you know, had huge foreclosure crisis back in 2007, 2008, but a lot of the curves look a lot like this. So mm -hmm. in 2005, you know, we had, you know, foreclosures were just starting and the, you know, around 2009, this blue line is the number of houses posted for foreclosure. So in the state of Texas, you could have in one month, 30,000 houses were scheduled for foreclosure. Mm. And of those, you know, 9,000 would sell. So about a third okay. of the properties would sell and go into foreclosure. And we had several years of that. And so 2009 is when I started investing. We still had lots of foreclosures, which meant the sales prices were still going down during that time. Um, and it didn't really start correcting uh, significantly till end of 2012. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people that have that got into this cycle right around 2012, I met a lot of people that in 2012, they started saying, buy as many houses as we can. From 2012 on, we pretty much have seen price appreciation across the board, yep. you know, no matter where you live. And so you could see as foreclosures were happening, prices were going down. They were at a peak in 2005. They were going down uh, very rapidly at this point. Like we'd have like 25 to 50% price declines. And I'll mm -hmm. show in another chart you know, some of that. Let me... Yeah, you can jump back and forth. And dude, while, while, while you're popping over here, what I, what I want people to do is anyone listening to the podcast version of this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I want you guys to go to carrotcast.com, carrotcast.com, or just go to our YouTube channel, look us up on Carrot. And because you're going to want to see the video version of this. Now, we're, we're going to do our best to, to visualize for you uh, through your ears uh, what, what you're seeing here. But if you guys want the full-blown visual of the, tra the charts, the graphs, the data that Aaron's showing, um, and we'll probably even look at some examples of real foreclosures happening right now a little bit later, go to carrotcast.com, watch the video version of this, and go find it on YouTube. All right, buddy. Back to you. Yeah. And don't judge me for the amount of tabs I have open. The, uh, <laughs> I'm, I get on stage and I tell people do not multitask, but Trevor caught me on a day of, of multitasking. So Dude, I, I, I'll beat you. I'll, I'll, I'll beat you today. And unless that's not your only window, if you have multiple windows like that, I did it. I did a good job today and I closed all my windows, but one. I'm only right. window now. <laughs> I should have been, I should have known we were going to dig into this stuff. Are so, you? And for people that are listening, so we've got this chart that's a graph that runs from 2005 to April 2020. And you see foreclosures going up in this graph pretty dramatically at like a 45 degree slope mm -hmm. from 2005 to 2010. You know, end of 2009, beginning of 2010, foreclosures peaked. Number of foreclosures peaked. And then for the next year or two, it stayed pretty steady at just having a lot of foreclosures. During that time, prices went down slightly. Mm -hmm. um, after about 2010 to 2012, prices continued to go down, but you can see the foreclosure postings after 2010 went way down. It started, you know, really, really, it went from, you know, 28,000 in one month to 20,000 three months later. 
right? So we have like a third. And in that time, prices were still going down because there were still more foreclosures in a normal market. Yep. And I can jump over to this other one to show the examples. So this was Sacramento. These were old stat you know, reports that I created back in 2009 as, and 2010 as I was trying to figure out where to invest. Right. And this is like a, so 95828 zip code in uh, Sacramento area. We see in May of 2007, the average sales price were $450,000. And the, and, and so three years later, so at the height of the, of the foreclosure boom, mm-hmm. prices were down to 150,000. So it was a third. So prices were corrected a 70% decrease That's in true. prices. And when you, when you think about that and look at that, and it wasn't just in one area, this is just the first one that I pulled up when I searched my, my ideas. And yep. so you could see, this is a similar chart to back then, you know, as REOs went down, you can see prices still decreased, but just not quite as fast. Mm-hmm. At the beginning, there was a dramatic decrease from 2007 to 2008 on price appreciation. After that, it continued to go down. Yep. So that's what happens when there's a crazy amount of foreclosures, more foreclosures than we can deal with. So this was it to 2020, around you know, 2012, uh, foreclosures would gradually go down every month. Prices started to appreciate. And every time prices go up, it, what happens is now when people are in foreclosure, there's a better chance that they can sell the house. Mm-hmm. In, 20, in 2010, someone owed 500000 on their house, but it's only worth two fifty dollars now. Foreclosure was the, on short sale was the only option, but foreclosure was the most common option. Yep. By the time 2013 hit, you know, we had a little bit of price appreciation. People actually more often had, had um, equity than not, so they could sell the house. So this is, so we've seen now from like 2015 to 2020, a very normal, strong real estate market. Mm-hmm. And this is what I've been trying to tell people when I'm, when I'm trying to predict how many foreclosures we're going to have. They say, well, no, it's the market's great. Yes. But over the last few years, we've had a really, really strong market, Mm -hmm. but we'll still see five or 6,000 houses a month posted for foreclosure in Texas. Yep. So then came March. And so March happened and this, here's, here was the historical stuff. Postings in March went down and they got cut in half. So instead of 6,000 postings, there's only 3,000. This was April because people got scared with moratoriums, but nothing sold. Gotcha. So instead of having 1500 sell, none would sell next month or 3000. And as that trend kept going for May, June, July, this yellow line here. So we're supposed to have, let's say 5,000 postings a month. And we've only we've had half of that getting posted and we're supposed to be selling, you know, 1500 a month going to foreclosure. And it's been less than less than 200 every month since. Hmm. So what happens there is it builds up the difference between like the yellow and the blue and the green and the red, right? So if we're supposed to have 1500 houses sell a month, and only 200 sell. That means every month there's 1,300 that, that are good, you know, in a strong market. These are vacant, abandoned houses for the most part. People lost their jobs. They have no intention of getting them back that are sitting as shadow inventory ready to be foreclosed on. Yep. So I originally thought that the moratorium was going to end in August. And if so, I did a little chart here that would show if, what if just the inventory in this spot, just the stuff that was in a healthy market. This isn't mm. thinking about unemployment, people losing their jobs and all the new stuff that's happening right now yep. as a result of COVID. This was just like, hey, what if they just turned it back on? The normal oh, foreclosures went caught, on. Caught back up with what was lost, yeah. Yeah, just the stuff that we postponed, just the normal, you know, a guy in April loses his job and moves to a different state, just that house that hasn't mm-hmm. foreclosed yet. So these would be the numbers that we've seen. Now that moratorium has been extended. And so now we're going to see through October, November, December, you know, more buildup. So this jump would potentially be higher. And so, so visualizing this for those listening, uh, essentially, like he was saying, normally postings in Texas is about 5,000 a month sales, you know, I'm making up a number, but 20% of that number around there. And then, um, what, what his graph shows now is just to make up for the postings that would be normal that were, uh, uh, you know, in the moratorium, it jumped about 15,000. Now that doesn't include uh, the moratorium moving forward. So we're potentially looking, it looks like Aaron, you know, 15 to 20 plus thousand uh, foreclosures that could hit when normally, let's say six months ago, it would have been 5,000 in a month. Yeah. So the, so we'll have a few more months of that. So instead mm-hmm. of hitting 15,000 every month that gets extended, you pretty much jump it up 3,000 more. Yep. So instead of seeing 15,000, we'll potentially have 25,000 you know, postings in a month period and just the number of houses that should have sold. And again, it's the caveat. This is an, this, these are good, healthy, normal markets. This isn't new unemployment. When you post that back to the chart in history, you know, what, when was the last mm. time we saw 15,000 a month? Mm. Well, that was June of 2013. Well, what if now it hits 21,000 because of this new moratorium? Mm. Then we're jumping back to 2010, 2011 numbers. Yep. So the, so the highest we've ever seen in Texas since 2010 
over a one month period. Mm-hmm. Now, when this, when the same thing happened in like the hurricane, you know, Hurricane Harvey, I think it was in Texas, where they did like a three month moratorium. And then as soon, uh, because of the hurricane that happened on foreclosures, as soon as they turned foreclosures back on, they released 50% of the foreclosures that had been held up the next month and 50% the month after that. Mm-hmm. And so they had spikes that, so maybe it would look like that where instead of jumping all the way to 21, you would jump to, you know, 12 and 12, okay. you know, to try to see as they spread it out, but they did release them very quickly. So now we're, we could see numbers. I believe we're going to see numbers that are posted around that 20,000 mark. And people say, well, what about the cares act? What about the government intervention? The, that isn't protecting these ones. Mm. That's protecting people that lost their jobs because of COVID. That's gotcha. protecting, that's not protecting the normal, you know, foreclo- foreclosures happen in a healthy market. It protects lender, lenders, it protects, you know, it, it's the, it's the reason people give us loans. And so, yeah, so that's a big thing there is we're going to see, is I believe we're going to see a big uh, jump uh, in those foreclosures. We're going to hit those 2012 levels. And so what happens then as, as a result? So, we saw in that other chart I showed you, when all of a sudden foreclosures spike, they, there's there's a bunch of product on the market now, mm-hmm. and as that more and when it comes on, it also shows people like, hey, the new comps, the foreclosures become comps on appraisals and things mm-hmm. like that. So all of a sudden, you see, you know, ten thousand houses sell at seventy percent below market, resale gets goes down a little bit. You know, the, and then all of a sudden there's more supply, so sales prices go down a little bit. Now combine that with the end, you know, the, the re- reduction in employment. There are some cities that I've been to that are totally normal and have been, you know, we've, I've been on this RV trip from, from Texas out to California over the last couple of weeks. And we've seen places that are totally normal and we, but we've also seen places that are completely shut down. So I think that the catalyst when, when all that stuff starts to get released is we are going to see a big jump and that can be one of the catalysts that goes along uh, with that price correction for new people. Um, you know, I don't think the government can continue to do protections on extra unemployment and things like that. Mm-hmm. People need to, the solution that happened in 2007 was not that they did free rent, was mm-hmm. not that they ended evictions. It wasn't any of that. People downsized. Gotcha. People yeah. downsized. When they lost their, they would leave all their possessions in the house mm-hmm. and they would just go start fresh and they were happy to start fresh with like, all right, they would, they wouldn't have, they'd, they'd lose the house. They'd start over. Credit would be shot. But three years okay. later, you know, they'd be, they'd be going. And so that's really the only solution that I can, I can see happening uh, is downsizing in long term. The amount of how high that stuff ticks up, the longer, the more, the longer we have those moratoriums extended, the higher I see that spike and the better potential that there could be that I think something could really go wrong. Mm. Dude. So if, if you're an investor or, or even an agent, right? Like um, I, I keep on seeing a lot of postings in the real estate agent world where and from coaches, I really respect too, where they're, they're sharing or sharing all the data that is correct data, but what they're doing is it's showing the, the quote unquote rebound of buyers, you know, it's like, here's buyers pre COVID and then COVID and they shot down through here and they're showing the rebound of the, of what they're calling the real estate market rebound. Mm-hmm. And I think it's decently deceiving. Yes, it has rebounded. It's insanely hot right now, but it's decently deceiving to think that that's going to continue to go for the reasons that you had mentioned earlier, right? There's a lot of reasons why some of them are healthy and some of them are not why that, that pop is happening. And, and it's not realistic for it to stay that, that long. So if you're an investor, when you know this information, like, I want to know what, what are you doing? Cause you've been through it. You've got access to the data. Uh, I mean, you own the software company that has this data, especially in Texas. You, you guys are like the only ones with this data in Texas, but what are you doing yourself, Aaron, looking uh, when you're looking for opportunities? Are there certain yeah. types of properties you're looking for? Are there, is there a time period where like, well, I'm going to wait until this time period when I think that things are probably going to be best. Um, are you going to be buying them and putting them in as rentals? Are you going to be buying them and flip? Like what, what's your strategy moving forward into the next 18 months? Yeah. And those, you're right. Those other coaches, the, the information they're providing is hundred percent accurate, right? There yeah. are, you know, sales, some the people I know had the best July's they've ever had in business and they had mm-hmm. really slow, you know, May and June. And so stuff is selling, but it is completely, you know, what, what was the word you used? The, uh, you know, it, it's completely accurate, but it's completely deceiving. Mm -hmm. because it can't really, because no, I believe that it can't sustain for a variety of reasons. And, and it'll become some affordability stuff. It'll become again, when a house that's worth 120,000 is getting offers at 150,000. Um, you know, those are big changes there, you know, as we see them. One of the things that 
you know, one of the, the news pieces that I, that I actually spoke about on one of my podcasts yesterday was it said that, you know, 2 million, you know, new buyers are on the market right now. And so, and so that's like a big news piece. Well, so what it is, is it's people that were living in San Francisco and we're living in Austin, Texas, and we're living in Seattle and they've now been told they can work from home. Mm. And so these 2 million people could not at their salary, could not afford to buy a house. They had to rent in San Francisco. They had to rent in Austin. They had to you know, rent in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Now that they can live wherever they want and work remotely, they can move 50 miles out of town, hundred miles out of town in Austin to buy a, a you know, an average house close to downtown. You're talking a million five, mm. you go 30 miles, you're talking a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so the 30 miles, you get a million dollar swing on your price point. And so, so we're going to see that. And that's really going to prop up those, you know, outside neighborhoods. And some people might go, I've always wanted to live in downtown Austin. Now I can buy at a discount. Mm -hmm. Now's my chance to go in there. A buddy of mine had a, you know, a house, had a condo downtown Austin. It's like a $2 million condo. As soon as COVID hit, he, you know, he was like, I need to sell that thing. It was an extra house of his. He, you know, he went a hundred thousand under what he wanted. He was Mm -hmm. the only one on the market. Now there's 20 condos listed, you know, for $2 million in that building. So when he listed, he was the only one. Now there's 20 listed. So there is more stuff selling. And the only city in the U S that has more inventory right now than it had a year ago is San Francisco. Hmm. There are more houses on the market in San Francisco than they had listed a year ago because people are leaving. So some people will see that news and go, Hey, there's 2 million new buyers that are rated by these first time home buyers. I think there's a big opportunity in that for agents to go find those people, find the good out outskirt developments outside these cities, you know, promote to first time buyers, promote to people that were renting before there's kind of that short term. So, but again, that's, so it looks really awesome. It's going to look really awesome for the places 30 miles. That's why somebody's paying me 30,000 more than my house is worth. Yep. But the, but at the same time, it's not sustainable. It's a gotcha. temporary inflated thing. So what I'm doing is right now, as people are moving out of my rentals, so I've got, I've got houses, I've got people moving out of rentals that moved in a year ago. They were like this example and I'm selling my houses. So mm-hmm. if somebody moves out and so it's like my basis was a hundred, hundred thousand dollars, I was renting it for 1100. Now I can sell it for 150. Yep. The reason I'm doing that is I believe that I will be able to rebuy that house or a house next door that makes 1100 bucks a month in rent for a hundred next year. Yep. And it might be 12 months from now, it might be two years from now, but I know that this, that, that this demand is not going to last and I'm going to be able to buy a house there for cheaper. So I'm going to, part of the reason I'm doing that too, is I usually buy a lot of foreclosures mm-hmm. and I'm having to pivot a bit because I used to buy 10 to 20 a month. And since April, I've bought like three. Gotcha. Right, because of yep. what's happened. So I have to find other ways to generate that. So it's like, all right, when people move out, I'll sell those houses because right now people are going to pay more than they're worth. Mm-hmm. Now the other strategy goes back to 2009. So what would happen in 2009 is every month we would have price declines of like 5%. Mm. The market would just go down 5% a month. And the, and the way that we were able to make money back then is we would buy the house, you know, for 70 cents on the dollar, we would fix it in four or five days. I've got all these YouTube videos of these giant houses that, <laughs> that had, you know, $25,000 remodels. So we did them in four days and we'd Jeez. stack it up. You'd put it on the market four days later and you'd sell it for 90 cents on the dollar. So you had to, you had to beat the market on the way down. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the strategy that we're going back to now. So we are, we are buying flips. I'm not buying any rentals right now. I'm not buying any holds and people will say, well, what if it cash flows? Yes, there's a chance that you get one that cash flows, but I think I'll be able to get one for cheaper next year yep, or two gotcha. years from now, whenever that correction is. I'm buying flips that take little to no work on them with the idea that I can you know, fix them quickly. With a hot market like this too, we used to always make sure they have brand new paint, brand new flooring, brand new everything. And when I had my tenant move out of that last house and I listed it and the demand was so high, I realized that now for the foreclosures that I'm buying, I'm buying ones that are, you know, close to turnkey. And in the past, I would have replaced the carpet. I would have painted it. I would have replaced the appliances and I'm putting them on the market the same day. I'm buying them. I'm putting them on the market the same day for what I think is, you know, kind of a top dollar price with the idea that they'll do a request for repair and I'll correct that way. So in a market that's falling, I'm okay with flipping and the, but only quick flips. I'm not going to buy anything that could be a one or two month remodel because okay. this, it's a, it's a game of hot potato. Yep. Like you're, ha- you're having to buy based on these inflated prices. Um, in a perfect world, I would say, well, th- right now they're selling for 150, but I, I know that it's only worth 120. So I'll buy it for 90, hoping to sell it for 120, mm. but you're not gonna be able to buy a house. So gotcha. the w- one strategy is sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Another is you have to like go ahead right now and flip knowing that the prices are inflated 
but you got to be quick and you got to be willing to, you know, don't take anything long-term, try to sell it below market and sell it quick and be quick to lower the price because there is everybody getting a ton of offers. If you're not getting an offer in the first week, the, then you got to lower that price because it means you're chasing the bottom. Gotcha, dude. You guys, I, I want, especially anyone who owns rentals, I want you guys to go back and listen to that part. Uh, right after this, I'm doing a, a call with a guy named Raul out of, out of Miami, who he did something similar where um, he, he's been exiting from his rental properties. He's stacking up cash. And then uh, he's been doing private lending for a while but now he's stacking up the cash and going out there and deploying it in private lending. And then he's waiting until, until values go back down to buy again. So I, I have a more personal question for you, like from, from me, and this is, this is part of my agenda with this series. Like I want to find out what I should do. So I, I own a, a four unit building that I've had like the first property I ever bought. It's up there by the college in Klamath Falls. It's always cash flow, but it's never been an amazing, like I've never taken any money out of that property. Right. It's like pay a new roof, buy a new roof and put new siding on new windows, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there is a little bit of deferred maintenance, especially inside, not deferred maintenance. It just needs renovated inside. It's, it's been the same since I've owned it. Um, it's a four unit. Are you seeing uh, prices inflate right now on, on those small multifamily units too? And if you had one like that, would you sell it uh, right now and then hold on to the cash and buy something cheaper later? Or is that one where, where it's like, well, it's different than a single family. Just hold on to that and buy something different. Yeah. One thing that's affecting too is what kind of loans we have on stuff. There are some stuff we have loans that are kind of locked in for the next five years. So even when yep. people are moving out, we're just going, Hey, we, we have the cash flow and we're going to stay in there. So your cool. fourplex near the college, there's a couple of things that impact that is, is it occupied right now? Yep. It's, it's always occupied. It's an owner finance loan. That's pretty awesome. So, mm -hmm. you know, especially with colleges right now, I think, you know, Klamath Falls is a place where, COVID regulation is not hitting as hard as other places. So I could see yeah. them going back to school there quicker than other places in California, you know, in San Luis Obispo, like in particular, where there's a lot of like really expensive condos right by the school mm. and people haven't been renting there for six months and they're not going to for the next year. I would try to sell one of those, yep. you know, to get yep. rid of it. If you've got a, if, if, if it's cash flowing and you've got, you know, owner finance debt on it, that you're going to keep, that would be one that, I guess two ideas. You could go ahead and try to sell it to see what happens. Mm -hmm. So the, you just say, Hey, I'm going to try to sell it. And if I get this premium amount, it's a good time to cash out with the intention and the belief that you'll buy it again. Yep. Right. That you'll okay. be able to buy the same one. You know, we have condos next to each other at the running Y. I sold yep. mine last month. Oh, you the, did? What, yeah, what we sold, sold for <laughs> 180, you know, what? so the, no yeah, way. so the, yeah, it was a crazy amount and it was 30 grand more than we bought it for a year ago. Yeah. Right. And, and that was one where we, we love it. And mm -hmm. I was, and the, and it's a, it's a great property. And when we were, we've been Airbnb in it, but we were like, you know what? I think right now with this market, let's just see if we get this crazy amount of money for it. Yep. And if not, no big deal. We'll just keep Airbnb in. Mm -hmm. I don't need to sell it at all, but I think that right now people are willing to pay more than they would otherwise. Yep. And I think in a year or two, I'll be able to buy something for what I bought my, cause it was just a year ago. I bought it for one fifty. Yeah. For and, sure. uh, and we got an offer within three days and we're like, this is crazy. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think right now I'm playing with a lot of those types of assets too, where you could say, Hey, put it on the market. If it doesn't sell, you're no worse off. And mm -hmm. if you do, I don't think you need to fire sell it as long as it cash flows and covers the debt, especially with owner finance debt. You want, if you do sell, you want to be able to have like, all right, it's, it's, Hey, I got this cash and now yep. I'm going to be able to go do this with it. Even if it's holding cash, I'm holding more cash right now than I ever have mm -hmm. um, because we want to have the ability to take advantage of whatever might be next. Gotcha. Dude. So one, one thing I want to, I want to dig into here for, for the next few minutes, if you can pull up the screen again, one thing that was really cool that you were showing in Instagram was like actual foreclosures that were coming out. And, and it sounded like there were some different types of foreclosures that are coming out now than, than our normal and foreclosures aren't my game. You know, it's, it's just not, I, I don't know experiencing it. I'm very, very fascinated by it. And something I want to look at this next, this next cycle. But, um, talk about that for a little bit. Are you seeing different types of foreclosures hit the market now than you have historically? And what are some of the more interesting ones that you're seeing? Like, are there opportunities outside of residential that people should be looking at or are commercial foreclosures crazy right now? Yeah. So the commercial foreclosures right now is there's, there's a ton of them and something that's unique. So a lot of the stuff I post on Instagram over the last couple of weeks was unique commercial properties that were going for sale. Mm -hmm. And so there was, you know, bars and restaurants and there was whole strip malls and there was medical office buildings, there were storage units, there was RVs, you know, so 
I was sharing this with the with the, the company that has uh, you know foreclosure radar, property radar over in you know Nevada and California, mm-hmm. and I was talking with the guys over there and saying, "Hey, this is what we're seeing in Texas. Are you seeing that there? They are not seeing that in California yet. They're still mm-hmm. seeing very, very strong." Um, you know, those commercial types, they're not seeing uh, those changes yet. Gotcha. So let me, but, but when I pull up the commercial in Texas, we're seeing a lot of really interesting stuff uh, that happens. So if you can see my screen here. Yep. The, this is just a, a giant office building here, $12.6 million note, right? So the, it went to, there was an opening bid for it, 10.4 million and it sold for 10.4 million. And you, and you look at these, so that's a, that's a commercial opportunity. It's on the airport in Addison. There's a private airport here. Mm, it's and it's like it's part of, property. yeah. So the, it's part of a pro, part of a private airport, part of like these hangars and some other stuff over there. You know, that's a super unique sort of foreclosure. And I actually, I'm a little surprised by that because I think that private airports may be doing better than they would be uh, in the past. Oh, you, know, Jim, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's a, it's a unique opportunity. So the, this one was a, let me see if I could figure out. So this is like a, a farm. This is a commercial property uh, as you look at it, but there's, you know, there's silos over here. It was a two and a half million dollar note. The opening bid came out at $1.6 million on it. Uh, You know, jumping through different commercial properties, I'm going to go down to some that were the most interesting on here. So this was, this is one that I thought was really interesting. So this is, you know, redneck heaven is this, you know, (laughs) bar and restaurant in Dallas that had its own reality show. That a year ago, if you went there, you there was a line like a block long mm. of people always trying to get in. It was the one of the busiest places up in Texas. The loan on it was four point six million. The lender let it go for one point five million. Oh my gosh, Dude, it's, it's a, a huge third, property. Jeez. It's a huge property, a third of the price. And yeah, I have to imagine there would have been an opportunity there. So yeah, I get right now they're shut down with COVID, and I get that they could not service that debt because that debt before was what like probably 58,000 bucks a month yep. for, for the debt. So he says, Hey, I'm closed. But what if you bought this for 1.5 and then you went and talked to him and said, Hey, I can, do you want to lease it again for 15,000 ah, a month or 20,000 a month? Like mm. you've got to, before they were the owners of it, but maybe they want to be a tenant. Like if their business, you know, couldn't perform before. So those are some of the opportunities that are there. Um, yeah. So this shows up as a commercial property. It's just a really small you know, commercial property. Mm-hmm. Let me try to find a couple other ones that are oh, cool. that were neat. This is, you know, so this was a state farm office, <laughs> right? So this is just a, a small office building from a, a state farm agent, the you know, 157,000 that loan yep. went to foreclosure on. And so you see a lot of like kind of small business stuff happening gotcha. as you circle out really neat properties. You're seeing, I've never before seen, uh, you know, storage units going to sell. And there's one really interesting was Texas State University. One of the buildings on the Texas State University campus was in foreclosure. And the bar, the borrower was Texas State University. (laughs) Oh my God. You're like, that's what would you do with that property? Like you try to see that and I say, well, you're going to, if you're going to buy a building on a university campus, like I think there's probably a lot of things you could do do with Mm -hmm. that, whether it's repurposed to something for others, but that probably goes to show what the impact of COVID is having on, you know, education and buildings and things like that. So stuff I'd never seen before, universities get building foreclosed on. And maybe people didn't even know, like if you walk through a campus, like University of Oregon, big old campus, there's probably loans on different buildings there. And people would have thought a university was the best borrower ever, but so they would have thought they were, they were bulletproof. So really unique and storage units, people are investing in mobile home parks, really entry level stuff. So there's a lot. Of, and the reason there's more opportunity in commercial than maybe before. Now you have to be careful because yeah. I'm not personally investing in commercial, because I think it's a little bit scary of a business. I know we only got a couple oh, yeah. minutes left, there but the, um, but commercial is there's big opportunities for it right now because during this moratorium foreclosure, foreclosure moratorium, commercial is not protected. So one oh, thing is, okay. is they still get to go to sale and lenders are probably quicker to foreclose on them right now because they need to get some of their money back on their books, right? right. Because, because, you know, whereas they may have done a workout with their, you know, redneck heaven before now they're like, Hey, we need to foreclose on that to get that cash back because we have all these other per single family loans that we can't cover. So I think they're quicker mm-hmm. to foreclose than they were before, but the double whammy too is COVID and quarantine has killed small business, has killed, you know, commercial buildings. There was, I didn't get to see it. I didn't find it when I came up with the list there, but there's, 
you know, these these huge strip malls, you know, that the, you know, that their main centers, you've got like, you know, rest, you know, got, got grocery stores and stuff as the hub tenant and they're in foreclosure four and 5 million bucks. I think there's neat opportunities there. Um, when you look at the, you know, they'll have to be repurposed. Grocery yeah. stores have performed and things like that. It's all about redoing the pricing. I don't mm. think people are going to look at retail anymore as a hundred percent occupied deal. You got to say, gotcha. Hey, what's the cash flow at 50% occupancy? Dude, that's, that's a really good tip. Well, one, one thing that, that I want to want to kind of wrap this with and, and dude, it, it'd be fun even you know, here in the, in the near future, coming having you come on and specifically show people how to use your software, how to use the data. Um, it, we, we barely kind of broached the subject there and, if people who are watching the video version of this saw you clicking around through the Roddy's foreclosure um, software and prop hawk, where can people use the software? Where, where can people find it? And specifically, dude, uh, what, what I want you to, what, what I want you to say is we have a lot of customers in Texas. What specifically do you guys have that nobody else has in Texas? Because a lot of people use prop stream and systems like that, which are great systems, but what's the difference between the data that you've got and the data that they've got in Texas? Yeah. So the, we have, we all have access to the same public records data, right? But nobody has access to the foreclosure data like what we have. So we'll, so when it comes to some of those comparisons, like, yeah, we have the same public records data, but then we have our own stuff that we put on it. We have our own analysis that we put for, for how much it's going to be worth. And again, that foreclosure data, we're going and we're getting it from the courthouses and compiling it. And to find out how much something sells for, we're standing at every courthouse and we're recording the sales and writing it down and uploading it into our Uh software. So there are other companies that say they have it, right? We have competitors, you know, PropStream will say they have foreclosures in some of those areas, but when you pulled up, they have 50 to 60% of the postings. Mm. Now, some people will say 50 to 60% is plenty, but if you go to an auction and you see, you know, somebody buy a house and nobody bid against him because he had the whole list, yep. it's the biggest difference with the foreclosures. So foreclosures are our specialty. We look at all sorts of, you know, we, we have lean data now where we can see if somebody stopped mowing their lawn. Hmm. Uh, we like to combine that and go, this person has equity and they haven't mowed their lawn in four months. They're hurting. You know, the, you hmm. know we should go knock on the door before they get scheduled for foreclosure. But the, you know, the hands-on data that you can't do through software that you can't do through public records is our difference. And because we've been the for, you know, the foreclosure focus in Texas, the, you know, and that's, that's where the heart has been, you know, our pricing analysis stuff is, is there, there's, there's nothing like it now in other, that is to say in other States, we have, we have the data, that same public records data that everybody else has, you know, for California, for Idaho, for Oregon, and some of those. And it's not that that data isn't good, but I'll be honest and say a lot of people have that data. So I'll tell you my software is better. I'll show you how, because it was software that I built for me. Gotcha. Used myself and gave it away. But yeah, the, in Texas specifically, there's no, no one comes close to our foreclosure data. And in the other places we say that we're investors that built the software. So it's tailored more for investors. Gotcha. Dude, I, I love it. So where, where can people uh, find out more about what you guys have going on with, with a uh, prop hawk and with Roddy's? Yeah. So best place is flsonline.com stands for foreclosure listing service. So flsonline.com, they can go on there. I've got people manning the live chat there like crazy. So someone can say, Hey, I just, I just heard Aaron talking about this. I'd be interested in that. And you know, Jack or Paul or one of our guys will treat you really, really good to answer whatever questions you have, help you figure out what software is there. Our customer service is fantastic. Um, come follow me on Instagram. I mean, as, as Trevor said, him and I, we, we love getting on there and like sharing data and stats and there's really nothing like getting that real time data and getting to see what I think with the news. And then I'm also, I'm the host of the real estate Rockstars podcast. And so you can go to hybendigital.com or look up real estate rock stars or real estate rock stars radio on any of those podcast places. And I, I talk about the news once a week and what I think is going to happen with real estate. Dude. Amazing stuff. Guys and gals, take those nuggets. If you own rental properties, seriously looking at selling them, if you can get crazy prices now, hold that money and then buy those same properties or ones like it cheaper in a year or two years. Uh, that's just the way to really work with the cycle. Um, and also make sure you guys are looking at those opportunities for, uh, you know, what's going to happen with foreclosures move forward. So Aaron, thanks for dropping the data on us. I'm excited for, for people to dig in and actually use it and uh, not be afraid of what's going to happen because there's always going to be opportunities. And, and the cool thing is this is an opportunity to serve the real estate market as a whole by getting uh, properties off of the bank's books, get them back into, uh, into private people's hands where they can live in them, beautify the neighborhoods. And that's where investors plug that gap and agents can as well. So thank you, man. Have an amazing rest of the week. And guys and gals, go follow them uh, over there and go grab their software. Check it out, especially in, in, in the Texas market. Talk soon. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys.